So um, I, I appreciate the chance to have it to speak with you all today about celiac disease. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to provide you some information on what is celiac disease, what causes it, um, how we make the diagnosis, and then uh, what we do uh, for follow-up for people. And then one of the most important parts of this is uh, what we do nutritionally, and that will be done by Cheryl Harris after I finish. So first of all, to talk about celiac disease itself, it's a uh, permanent intolerance to gliadin, which is a protein that's found in wheat, barley, and rye. And it causes an injury that's based on the immune system. So the immune system sees the body um, as being foreign, and the trigger for that is this gliadin protein. And there's a genetic predisposition. So that's the essence of what celiac disease is. Um, it's a global disease, uh, so it affects pretty much people in all parts of the world. So it turns out in our country, as is true for a lot of countries, the, the prevalence is about 1 in 100, so about 1% of the population. So even in the United States where we have a lot of technology, the ability to make diagnosis, only about 5% of the people in our country have been diagnosed. And children are at risk as much or even more than adults. And uh, so if we look at populations of children, like children who, who would come to a GI clinic, as I would run, if a child has abdominal pain and they come to my clinic, they have about 1 in 50 of those children will have celiac disease, all comers. If a child has Down syndrome, about 5 to 10 percent of all children with Down syndrome will have celiac disease. And children with type 1 diabetes, also about 5 to 10 percent of all children with type 1 diabetes will also have celiac disease. So what's important about what we've just covered? Well, first of all, celiac disease is very common. It's even more common, I think, than most people had appreciated. Uh, it should be screened for more often than it is. And again, only about 5% of the people in our country where we have all of this technology have been diagnosed. So there's a lot of undiagnosed people out there. So what causes celiac disease? Um, it's a combination of genes and grains. And so we have uh, some great maps of the world to show where the genes are found. And if people look at that, they'll see that, that these genes are found throughout the world, these genes that are associated with uh, celiac disease. And the grains that cause the problem are also found throughout the world. So it's not hard to appreciate why we find celiac disease really in every part of the world. So to get as basic into science as I'm going to get today, this is a, an inappropriate response of T cells. Uh, to gluten. So that's the essence of what causes that, that inflammation to happen in the intestine. Uh, it requires a genetic predisposition, so not everybody's going to get this. Most people eat uh, uh, rye and barley and wheat and have no difficulty, but those people with a genetic predisposition, they're going to get celiac disease. Um, you need to have that trigger, and the trigger is uh, thought to be the alpha gliadin um, protein, which is uh, found in gluten, which is again found in wheat rye and barley. So this, um, I'm going to show a slide to the group here that uh, has uh, the grass family, which is where wheat and barley and rye uh, reside, to show you that those are the ones that are the triggers for celiac disease. But all the other members of this family, and there's lots of other forms. So there's <coughs> oats, which are a different family within that, um, uh, within, the, within the grass family, they're a different tribe. Um, also rice. Um, and things like uh, teff and, and also, also millet, all separate tribes within that family. So those are all uh, safe um, foods to eat. So what about that genetic predisposition? As of 2010, we have not identified the gene for celiac disease. So we can't, I can't, we can't uh, send off your blood and, get, and tell you whether you have the gene for celiac disease. The best we can do is look at HLA markers. And again, if you're positive for those HLA markers that are found for celiac disease, realize you're in good company because 30% of the U.S. population have those too. So it really doesn't help us to know that somebody's positive. What's more helpful is to know if somebody's negative. But unfortunately, we have a few patients with celiac disease who are negative for those HLA markers. So as a general rule in our practice, we don't use those HLA markers. If one person in the family has celiac disease, if one child has it, there's about a 5 to 10 percent chance that the other siblings in that family are going to have celiac disease too. Uh, outside of that immediate family, like the first cousin and then the second cousins, it goes down and down. Uh, so it isn't as common. So I, if people <coughs> who are more in the extended family, not in, not, in that, uh, not in the immediate family, are having symptoms, then we absolutely would recommend that they get tested. But the, that 5 to 10 percent chance is really in that immediate family. If 
uh, if they're t uh, twins from the same egg um, and one of them develops celiac disease, there's an 80% chance that the other twin is going to develop celiac disease too. If they're twins from two eggs, um, then that chance if one develops celiac disease is about uh, 20 to 30 percent, so it's not as great. But just again, making the point, if you have the same genetic code, you have, you have a very high chance of getting celiac disease. And then people with HLA who are identical, they have about a 10 or to 30 percent chance of having celiac disease. If, if one person in the family, they, another pa person in the family have the same HLA typing, <coughs> then they have about a 20 to 30 percent chance of uh, developing celiac disease if one person has it.